Hello everybody and welcome along to this video which is Mr Johnson teaches London revision. So this is going to be useful for your GCSE English literature. This is paper two and this is section B of paper two and as a reminder this is where the exam board will print a question and will also print a copy of one poem and the question will ask you to compare it to another poem. So it could well be that they print London and choose London for you with a question. Alternatively, it could well be that you decide that London is the one that best fits with the poem that they choose. Either way, it's going to be one you want to know. Um, if you're being honest about it, London is a short poem. Um, in many ways, it's quite memorable and it's got some quite strong themes in it as well. So a good one to know, definitely. Um, you'll want to be ready to pause this video, adding notes as you go, because active revision is the best sort of revision. Don't just sit back and listen and think, yep, yeah, I'm done at the end of it. Make sure you're writing things down as you go. So with that in all in mind, let's move on then to the fact that you will need a copy of this poem in front of you for this really. Whilst I'll be putting the words up on the screen, it's really good to have your own copy, even if that's only on a screen in front of you. You can find it quite straightforwardly. If you see at the bottom there, it says search for Blake London poem, and that should bring that one up for you. So if you need to, pause the video now and go and do so. If not, take time to actually read the poem to yourself now, please, as well. A reminder that this is a poem, quite literally, as it says, about the city of London. We're talking about London in the sort of late 1700s, early 1800s here, um, but it's a corrupt city. You've got those in charge who are sort of making, taking money or through taxes from those who are often the least well off. And there's a real division between rich and poor. So corruption of a place and corruption of a city is what you want to have in mind when you pause this video now, just have a quick read of the poem, please. So let's talk about William Blake then, and let's make some notes on your page about him. So you can see the dates he was alive there. Um, English poet, but also an artist as well. Um, but he had quite radical views for the time where those who were educated would generally not want to sort of share power with others. Uh, Blake was certainly one who was very pro and positive towards changes in society, but also politics as well. Uh, he wanted to see social and racial equality. Now, racial equality at this time was, again, uh, a particularly rare thing to see from somebody. Um, but the social equality, so actually something that we sort of try and push towards much more now. These are ideas you see in Charles Dickens's work as well, for those of you who, uh, who study A Christmas Carol. The idea of almost, you don't want to call him a socialist, or talk about socialism, but the fact he wanted social equality is very much in line with those things. But this is about 40 years before Charles Dickens. Um, he also questioned the role of the church and its teachings and whether it was doing enough to actually support those in most need. So that all sets the context. This is a man who wanted to see change. And the poem, I think, certainly very much reflects that idea as well. A bit more context, so the time this poem was set at. Um, it was actually one of two big volumes of poetry that uh, Bl Blake wrote. So sort of a book of poetry, if you like, with multiple poems in it. The first volume he wrote was very positive and looked at sort of childhood and love, whereas the second volume, which is where London uh, features, certainly looked at the loss of innocence, so a bit more negative in its tone. Um, you've got to think about London at this time as an enormous contrast. Um, rich and poor really were very, very divided. The rich were very rich, the poor were very poor, and there wasn't a huge amount in the middle. But another thing just to set against this time period as well is the fact that over in France, the French Revolution was taking place or had taken place very recently before the writing of this poem. During the French Revolution, you saw um, lots of the people, if you like, the ordinary people who overthrew their corrupt ruling class. They were tired of it, the famine, they didn't have enough food, um, and basically there was a lot of executions, there were a lot of heads being chopped off. So over in France, there was a lot of change going on in society. And Blake certainly didn't want to see exactly the same thing happening with people's heads being chopped off, but certainly I think he saw the merits in the French Revolution. He even spent some time in France as well. Moving on then, think about the title, London. Uh, in the background there, that is St Paul's Cathedral, which still stands today for those who don't know London. Um, think about the title. It's very, as I've put there, simple, blunt. Does it almost sound angry in tone to you? Just London. Almost maybe sort of the sort of the corruption of London, I think, comes through in that. But certainly it's not overly descriptive. It doesn't give us any other clues. It almost allows, sort of draws us in to then read on to the rest of the poem. But I always say focus on titles. Just the fact that they can give clues. Maybe not so much in London, but a very descriptive title, I would suggest to you. 
And before we go through stanza by stanza, look at the poem as a whole. Look at the form of that poem. It is called form. I sometimes refer to it as structure, but the way it's laid down on the page. Look at that. Regular stanzas, four, 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 four. And within those stanzas, you've got the A-B rhyme scheme where every other line rhymes with each other. So from the top, you've got street and then meet, flow and woe, and that rhyme scheme repeats all the way through. There's regular end stopping as well, where you get the commas and the full stops taking place at the end, mostly, but not always. But certainly you can then have to ask yourself, OK, we can write on our page regular rhyme scheme or regular stanzas, but why? And in some ways, it's almost like we're trapped. It's trapped into this form, a bit like the people in the poem are trapped into uh, their place in society. So that's definitely what you want to have written down there. That regular uh, rhyme scheme almost sort of reflects that regular life where they are stuck. So again, being trapped, I think, is the good word to use there. Right, let's go through. I won't be able to comment on everything in the time I've got. Revision guides and revision websites and revision YouTube videos will offer other ideas to you, but I'll point out some of the main things that you want to pay attention to in this poem. Firstly, it talks about I wonder. So we're into a first person narrative here, probably from the point of view of Blake, but whenever we're in doubt, we call it the speaker. So the person in the poem who's speaking. So the speaker, I wonder through each charted street. Charted means like mapped out and almost like controlled in many ways. The sort of the connotation of something which is mapped out and recorded is that it's almost under someone's control. So each charted street. So already we're getting that feeling of oppression, people being controlled. Oppression is O double P R E S S I O N, the oppression of the state. And the state, which I refer to later, is also the people in control, the government, the state controlling the town or the city here. Near where the chartered Thames does flow, so even like the river, a natural thing is being controlled. And mark, and mark means to see, I mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. Now that's a different meaning of mark, like a dirty mark, like signs of, signs of weakness, signs of woe. So already we've got very negative uh, connotations going on here, a very negative tone to start with. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. So firstly, the thing to look at there is the repetition of in every, starting off the lines there. So again, almost like people are trapped. We are trapped as well, like they are in every, in every. We can't escape the start of that repetition. So you could look at that, certainly. So also, the mind-forged manacles is something I'd really focus on in those lines as well. Mind-forged, as in created in. When you forge something, you create it. The mind-forged and manacles are another word for like chains, like handcuffs, if you like, that you wear around your, wear around your wrists when you're trapped. So again, we've got lots of imagery here reflecting the idea of being trapped. But it's interesting that they are mind-forged manacles. Is Blake perhaps suggesting that it's the people's minds and they are just being controlled and allowing themselves to be controlled and perhaps they need to almost get rid of these mind forged manacles and realize that they can make a difference i wonder if there's a hint of revolution in that line perhaps you could argue but certainly on a simple level you could look at the very trapped uh, and negative imagery in that stanza there then we've got how the chimney sweepers cry and every blackening church appalls and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. So what have we got going on here? Firstly, he's seeing like chimney sweepers cry. So those people and the idea of black comes out in the next line as well. Chimney sweepers, people who quite literally used to go up from the, up in chimneys, cleaning out the soot. So it was a very dirty thing. And every blackening church. Now, you could talk about pollution being the ones that is blacking in the church. So making them look dirty, a bit like the picture in the background there, which is like a wall covered in dirty soot. However, blackening as well. Blackening has very negative connotations, but also that word corrupt could be applied to this one as well. So almost like how the church is corrupt even. The thing which is meant to help other people and be sort of a, a beacon of hope and good morals is in fact negative here as well. And the hapless soldier sigh runs in blood down palace walls. It's obviously very violent imagery there with blood, the connotations of that, but also down palace walls. Blood in palace walls is almost a direct hint at the French Revolution, um, where the, the monarchy over the king was um, beheaded in France, as were all the royal family. So again, it almost has that parallel going on there, a hint of what could happen in France, maybe if things don't change in the city of London. 
And here's our final stanza. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse. So youthful meaning young. A harlot is a prostitute. So we've got young prostitutes cursing, like shouting out in anger. So you've got a real mixed imagery there. Almost an oxymoron. I'd probably talk more about juxtaposition there of a young prostitute, which is a really sort of very sad idea we've got going on here. And just sort of shows the effect that London maybe has on the lives of these people, these women who are so desperate they have to go to prostitution. And how it blasts the newborn infant's tear. So like even the young, even the young are going to be corrupted in this city as well. They're trapped in a vicious cycle, a vicious circle. And then you've got final line, and blights with plagues, the marriage hearse. So real powerful language there, like the idea a blight is like a disease. Plague is another word for a disease as well. And it's just sort of controlling these people. They are under the control, and the plague could be a disease literally, but could also be the plague of those who are in charge and not doing what they want. So again, very clever language with double meanings there. Marriage, to get married, a hearse being the uh, the vehicle which carries uh, coffins, a marriage hearse. So again, is it like the idea of the cycle of life where you're trapped, you get married, you die? But lots of very negative language, I think you'll agree. So it's hopefully quite straightforward to see that he's got a very negative attitude towards the city, but particularly towards those who are running the city and causing the corruption. There's manacles for you. I'll just focus on that quickly. The idea, the metaphor of being trapped. So not literally there in the poem, but again, the metaphor. The blood on the palace walls, as I mentioned earlier, but go off and do a little bit more research. Look at the French Revolution as well. And that's what's quite a... This is for the higher marks, really. If you're able to draw those sorts of ideas out in your answers when you're writing about these poems, that's where you're likely to find yourself gaining higher marks. Just loads of corrupted imagery in this city as well. Just sort of the idea of blackness, darkness, and things sort of in disrepair, falling apart, being trapped in a cycle you can't escape from. Questions to pause. I'm definitely not going to have time to read through all of those questions, but certainly questions that I'm trying to get you to point towards bits of the poem and then add to your annotations, add to the notes that you are making. So you could answer these or you could use these answers to actually help you write more in your notes. Particularly thinking at the bottom there, though, what is the conflict between in this poem? So... Yeah, I'll leave you think about that one. I nearly gave away an answer, but I'm going to instead move on to talk about comparisons with other poems. So here you've got a poem which really focuses on place, and it really is focusing on the corruption of a place. So we could think about what works well with that. The Emigre is a poem which works really well with the corruption and a viewpoint on a place. In the emigre, it's very positive memories, whereas in this one, it's obviously very negative in tone, as we've discussed. So in some ways, those two work really well together as a comparison, because you've got opposites. Both are about places, however, in different sort of uh, tones and viewpoints. Also, extract from the prelude, very much about a place as well, how the effect of the place that is had on uh, William Wordsworth. And again, both very negative, although... Prelude is about the power of nature, whereas this is about the power of the city and power of people. So in many ways, those are some good comparisons that you could make, I would suggest. And that's the question I would get you to focus on. You will be asked to uh, compare to another poem. On this question, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just getting you to focus on this poem at the moment. How does Blake explore the effects of corrupt power? In a moment, you'll see my uh, example paragraph. For those who have watched these videos before, you'll know that. Um, if when it comes to you writing your own answer, in that box in the middle there, I've put, I would focus on the repetitive structure and the rhyme scheme and talk about how that reflects um, the way that people seem to be trapped because the people in charge have the power and those who are poor don't have the power to escape. So in that sort of is reflected by the repetitive rhyme scheme. But go back and watch that bit of the video again. I talked about that at the beginning. And it just leaves me time to talk about this, where you've got the blue, green, red, purple. Blue, use my sentence starters when you write your paragraph as well. Um, you'll find it gives it a real structure and it gives you enough detail as well. Lots of students, their answers are too short because they don't develop them enough. And that's what you'll get here. So in blue, I basically answer the question and give an example from the poem. Then I, in my next sentence, name a method. That's really important. The green is where I use my evidence. Uh, when you do the structure, you can just write about how it's um, a mirrored repetitive structure. And that is your evidence. The red is the analysis, including some word analysis. Purple is really, really important. I'm talking about what he's trying to teach us. If you write about that in your answer, you will gain good marks. I've run out of time, so I just will wish you the very best of luck.
Thanks for listening all the way to the end, and goodbye.